It's my pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Ron uh, Gowan, who is uh, currently senior medical advisor uh, with the MJW Corporation, where he provides radiation medicine uh, consultation to the NIOSH uh, York Badoz Reconstruction Project. He's also senior medical and scientific advisor at the Department of Energy Reacts in uh, Oak Ridge. Uh, he is uh, a board certified in occupational medicine and a diplomat of the American College of Preventive Medicine. His presentation is on the pseudo belger Hoyt cell as a retrospective dosimetry analysis of a radium dial painter cohort. Okay, thank you. Hello. Let me present part two of this saga. So this is the pseudo belger Hoyt cell. We're going to find it's a, a, a permanent dosimeter. We have a mounting amount of evidence that shows it's a permanent dosimeter. So let me show you this thing. Let's see, what do I do to advance it? Uh, oh, right here. Okay. okay. All right. Um, here's the Pelger Hewitt cell. It's a neutrophil, and it's, these are red blood cells. It's a neutrophil, it's a bilobed uh, neutrophil and with a, a thin chromatin bridge. So it's been known for a while. Now, I must admit to you, there's a lot of luck, as Dick pointed out. Dick and I, just for, for the record, Dick and I have known each other since the mid-70s, so 40 some odd years. We both started out doing whole body counting, so we've got a, we've got a history together. So first of all, we had done peripheral blood slides from the 1958 uh, Y12 criticality accident. There were eight patients there. And physicians save peripheral blood slides, and somehow they managed to last for 50 some odd years. And then Dick found out about this, and as he pointed out, directed us to the uh, trench uranium registry for the uh, uh, radium dial painter slides that we were fortunate to get that, that Stacy has been very helpful with. So what we what we have here is a great deal of, of good fortune, I think. So it reminds me of a quote that I heard one time. It's better to have a learned, better to have a lucky physician than a learned physician. So it's better to have a lucky physician than a learned physician. So I think there's a great deal of luck that we have. So before I came here, my son is dating a librarian. And so I said, Stacy, I need you to look up something for me. Where did this quote come from? So it comes from 1549 with the uh, Florentine philosopher group. So. Lucky physicians have been around for a long time. So let's take a look at, at some of this. The Pelger-Hewitt anomaly was described by Carl Pelger in 1928. He thought it was due to tuberculosis because his index patient had tuberculosis. And then G.J. Uh, G. Hewitt in 1931 showed it, showed it was a, a genetic mutation. The mutation is on the long arm of chromosome 1 and it's a defect in the laminin B receptor. The laminins, the B-type of laminins, are like the floor of the cell nucleus. So this has been known for a while. You see it, we all have a certain amount of, of these cells. The average that we've got so far is about 4%. So if I got your blood, we'd, we'd see this too. Um, so um, we recently described this with the Y12 uh, cohort in a uh, health physics journal last March. And so we, we showed that it's a permanent dosimeter. It, it seems to be uh, developed very quickly, and it's permanent up to 17 years that we've been able to show. So here's a Pelger Hewitt cell from 1958, 17th of June, 1958. So here's the bilobe nucleus, here's the bridge, RBCs, red blood cells here. And here's the long-term persistence. So on the y-axis, we have the percentage of these things as a function of all the neutrophils versus time in days. So it's constant over uh, essentially about 15 years at about 10%. Now we were directed by our good fortune again to the USTUR collection. And as Dick pointed out, we have 166 former radium dial painters, 35 of whom had zero dose. Uh, so Stacy directed us to those and of 166. Members of the cohort had gestion of radium-226 and 228 at an average, at early age. The average age is about 20 years, plus or minus five years. The range was 13 years. So these are, a lot of these are young women. 
and during the years 1914 to 1955. And as Dick said, the exposure duration was from 1 to 1,820 weeks, and Meridose from very low 1 milligray up to 6.7 gray. And most of these slides were in the early 60s and early 70s. So here is the slides that I got from Stacy. Oops, what do I do here? What's this? Um, the first box of slides, this is a peripheral blood slide. So how do you do a peripheral blood slide? If you've never done one, you take a drop of blood, you put it on a glass slide, and you take another glass slide, and you, you smear it out. It takes some technique, actually. And let it air dry, and then you stain it. So these things tend to be permanent over 50, 60 years or, or more. So we're extremely fortunate here. So here is case uh, 09064. This is a young woman, she was 25 years old, who was exposed in 1916. She started work in 1916 and was exposed for nine weeks. And so you can see the, the bridge, the bioneutrophil in the bridge here. And you see a bunch of red blood cells. So we've looked at our whole cohort, and now we have the red Meridos and milligray versus the Pilger Hewitt percent. So I just, I count about 500 neutrophils. I see how many have this morphology, and it just look at the percentage. And so, you know, it's a fair amount of scatter, but we're able to do a regression line. And uh, the R squared is 0.71 here. Now the red are the six uh, cancer cases that we had in this cohort. We had five that had osteosarcoma, and one patient who had uh, a nasal cell carcinoma. And so we've looked at those separately. So here are the sarcoma cases. Again, we're looking at the Pelgerhut percentage on the y-axis versus Meridose. Here are zero-dose controls. It's a, the controls for the uh, radium dial group cohort are about what we now have with our normal population. So that's good. It's consistent. And so we have a linear relationship here. Okay. Maybe we have a linear relationship. It looks actually like it, it does more of a sigmoidal. So if you actually go and do a sigmoidal plot, here's what it looks like. R squared is 0.991. So these are the six cases. Here is our zero control. So zero is a little bit maybe bigger than four, somewhere in that range. So is it linear or is it sigmoid? So our linear fit, and this is all fairly recent data, the linear fit is um, R squared of 0.77 for the sarcoma data, and the sigmoid fit is 0.91. So the sigmoid fit is better. So this, I think, is evidence, again, for a threshold effect. So now let's take a look at what you guys know from the radium dial literature. This, now, here on the y-axis, we have the risk of sarcoma versus dose, skeletal dose, classic pictures you've seen. And so we had the linear fit, but then the quadratic fit was better. So we agree with the older data using a new by decimeter. And this by decimeter, we have done uh, work with AFRI on using non human primates. And so we see it persistent there too under gamma radiation. With the Y12, we had a neutron gamma mixed field. We see it persistent there. And so there's every evidence that this is a persistent decimeter. And it seems to be well fit by a, a, a sigmoid plot. So, you know, in conclusion, the uh, Pelger Hood anomaly from peripheral blood, it's easy to do, takes five minutes to do. It's reasonable surrogate for alpha dose to bone marrow. And evidence points to a sigmoid response in here, suggestive of a threshold effect. Now, because we have 35 zero dose controls and 130 some odd with dose, we're able to do a receiver operating curve analysis and look at the sensitivity and specificity of this by decimeter, uh, but you know that will include in our paper, but we we haven't done it here. So I think this is an exciting technique. It's quick, and we're actually working toward automation of this. So with that, I'll quit. And thank you very much. goes from 14 till years old up to 40, right? Mm -hmm. So the 14 years are supposed to be kids. So how you calculate the dose? Which model you use for adjustments or? 
Yes, uh, Dick, when he did his dosimetry, did a separate model for the, for the kids. Ah, okay. And yeah, so we did separate. Basically, adult and 15 years old. Yes. Uh -huh. Excellent. Let me just make a, a couple of real quick comments. To me, and I'm by no means any sort of radiobiologist, the fact that the osteosarcoma incidents and the pelger ulet anomaly incident look exactly the same in these cohorts say to me that Mother Nature is trying to tell us something about I think, what's going on. I think so. Well, from the I linear... I don't know what yet, but... Yeah, from the linear response for the pelger hewitt we see that the pelger hewitt effect is just a surrogate for dose. And so, since the skeletal dose predicts a sigmoid, you would expect that ours would predict a sigmoid, too, which we were a little bit late to realize, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Then the other thing is, with my chair of the USTUR Science Advisory Committee hat on, this sort of thing is exactly why the registries were established, and now we can bring a method to bear to get important scientific information out of the registry's data that wasn't even dreamed of when the registries were created. And it's just a message of how important this resource is and why it needs to be maintained. So I will now step down from my soapbox and hope DOE is listening. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you.